He came, he opened the door, and he was screaming, come on, help me. Somebody shot my mother and father. And everyone ran out of the bar, and that was it. They Did all took go? off. No, I had to stay. I was 10 anymore. They all jumped in his car and took off. Today, police combed the DeFeo's handsome three-story house for clues while divers explored the backyard swimming pool for the still-unfound murder weapon. Police have been questioning the son, Ronald, and now say he is being, quote, safeguarded. Investigators say without explanation that they now feel young DeFeo was in the house at the time of the murders, but they're not yet considering him a suspect. And so we forth. have no suspect at this time. It's we have no indication of the motive at this time. What about Ronald uh, DeFeo, the son, the surviving son? Ronald is being safeguarded by the Suffolk, Suffolk County Police at this time. Why safeguarded? Why? Because the six members of the family dead, and we don't know why, and he's the sole remaining member. The auto suspect? He's not a suspect at this time. Few people in the neighborhood knew the family well, but those who did describe them as close-knit. Well, I figured, I think they were just very sweet, very religious people, very family-minded people. And that's about all I could say. Very good, very generous, this type. I mean, very close with their children. There's one element in the usual mass murder story which seems to be missing from this case. There's no sense of fear in this community. No feeling of a mass murderer on the loose. People we talked to seem to feel that whatever was the motive for this crime, it had something to do with the family. It's not something that's going to return to bother anyone else. In Amityville, Long Island, Phil Barno, News Center 4. In 1974, on November 13th, around 3.15 in the morning, the DeFeo family was shot to death while they slept in their beds. Now, there's a lot more to this story than meets the eye. One is that a lot of people don't realize it, but Ronald Sr., or not Ronald Sr., I'm sorry, Ronald Jr., was actually married. Yeah, he was married. And on November 12th, he was actually staying with his wife in New Jersey, okay? And what had happened was his... um. His sister got into a fight with her father, uh, Ronald DeFeo Sr., okay? And she had actually pulled a knife on him. It got pretty violent. That was the case in the DeFeo home. The house was extremely nuclear, a lot of bad vibes in there. And let's just put it this way. None of the family liked their dad. And, you know, Ronald actually pointed a shotgun at or a, a rifle at his dad before and pulled the trigger and it didn't go off. And that's when his dad went to Jesus and, you know, he did all this biblical stuff and, and thought that what that represented was that God had a mission for him or something like that. Um, Ronald DeFeo Jr. or Sr. was very, very big into um, spirituality and stuff like that, um, what it was like to die, life after death. He was really, really into those topics. But basically, Ronald Jr. gets home on November 12th of 1974 at his Amityville home and they're all in the basement meaning they're all it's um himself Ronnie his sister Dawn which is was 18 by the way and I think one or two friends were there as well but basically what had happened is Ronnie got really drunk and really high on heroin and and Dawn was pretty high and they were all talking about you know how to get rid of the problem meaning their dad well they had come up with the solution a scenario to take out their dad so basically they agreed on doing it that night okay so there was a witness or two in the basement that actually seen and heard what they were going to do so there are people out there that really know what happened and anyways what what happened was after they all went to bed after the family went to bed Ronald and his sister Dawn went into the parents' bedroom. Okay, they went into the parents' bedroom, shut the door. The dad started to wake up, and automatically, Ronnie DeFeo Jr. shot his dad in the back. Okay, so that subdued him for a minute. Now, as soon as he did that, Dawn fired at the mom, killing the mom. Actually, I think she shot her. Yeah, I think she shot her twice. And the dad started to get back up, so another round was put into Mr. DeFeo Sr. Um, from that point on is where a lot of controversy develops. Um, it is said that Ronald DeFeo Sr. had two different caliber bullets inside him, which would mean there were two guns, okay? 
and this theory is pretty concrete in my opinion basically um ronnie said i have to go get some heroin in brooklyn whatever you do when i leave don't have anybody over don't talk to nobody don't call nobody nothing just wait till i get home and we'll take care of it so on his way to get heroin um he always had the radio on he said he always listens to music and he said the guy on the radio said it was 302 a.m okay now i say this because the coroner said that the um the killings all took place around 3 15 a.m so ronnie swears by this that he was actually not in the house when those murders took place now keep this in mind the DeFeo family was involved in organized crime. It was big time in the DeFeo family. And let's just put it this way. Their dad, I believe, killed a few people. And, you know, a lot of their family did. And and Ronnie actually talks about this in some of his interviews and stuff, about what his dad used to do and how his dad used to get him involved. Um, very chaotic um, situation for Ronnie, no doubt about it. But he comes home and... All is quiet except for there's some music playing on the third floor, and that's where Don DeFeo's bedroom is at. Well, on the way up, he stopped and looked at his Mark and his brother Mark and John. I believe Mark was 12, and John was either 8 or 9 when they were killed. And what Ronnie found was that his two brothers had been murdered. They were dead. So he ran into his sister Allison's room, who was 13, and she was dead too. Um, all three of these individual well mark and john each had shots to their back to their back half and um allison she was shot in the face i'm going to post a crime scene photo of that and um you know just if you don't want to see it skip past it but right after this clip i'm going to post that um i just want to show you the authenticity of what really took place in amityville but anyways Ronnie goes up the stairs to confront his sister Dawn, and she's like, according to him, she said, Oh, my God, Butch, what are you doing here? Now, the family used to call Ronnie DeFeo Jr. Butch. Okay, that was his nickname. And he said, Who shot those kids? Who shot them kids? And anyway, Dawn had the rifle. It, it was a modern rifle. And they got into a wrestling match. His sister had completely flipped out. And basically, Ronald overpowered her and um took a shot got her right in the head she died put her on a bed now this is the weird thing according to the coroner the bodies were never moved okay but other examinations have blood spots in different parts of the room where dawn could have been shot and the same goes with the dad the dad actually may have made it outside in the doorway of his bedroom it's also you know there's speculation of that as well because there was blood on the um the the door frame unless you know somehow either dawn or um ronnie had got blood on them on them and actually put it on the doorway by mistake i don't know but there was that blood there and it was the dad's blood that after it was tested it belonged to the dad so maybe he did get up and that's ultimately where he um met his demise was in the doorway not on the bed but either way everybody was face down even dawn now, Ronnie would have had to have put her back in the bed and covered her up the way that he did. And I believe that's the case because if you're shot in the face with the Marlin rifle, blood's going to go everywhere. And you're not going to be able to clean that up. Like, you know, blood's hard to get out. And if you look at the crime scene photo of Dawn laying in her bed, it just, you can't even tell that she's dead or there's no blood whatsoever. There's none. But. That's it, guys. I mean, Dawn did have unburnt gunpowder on her nightgown, on her arms and her hands. And what that means is at somewhere during a 24-hour period, Dawn had handled and fired a weapon. So that's pretty concrete evidence that she did fire something. Now, back what I was saying about the family being involved in organized crime, okay, their house was being cased by an actual police officer on November 12th, 1974. And he cased it all the way out through the murders, guys. That's what's crazy. He cased this whole thing out through the, the, the entire incident. And he saw Don DeFeo leave the house for a brief minute and throw something into the water. Now, ultimately, a 
um, handgun was found there. So could have Dawn dis you know, discarded the handgun then and there and the cop actually seen her do it because you know that Ronnie DeFeo Sr. actually hid the Marlin rifle in a storm drain in Brooklyn, New York. So I don't know, guys. As far as it goes with the paranormal aspect of Amityville, one year later after the killings, um, the DeFeo family, or not the DeFeo family, the one year after the DeFeo family died in that house, the Lutz family moved in, and then they moved right out the same month, and they claimed that that was the most haunted house they've ever lived in or ever experienced, never experienced anything like it until they were there. In my honest opinion, after doing an absurd amount of research on this, I believe that the Lutz family fabricated these events to make money. Honestly, I really do. With that being said, could that place be haunted? Absolutely. Six people died in that house violently of murder. So yes, it could be haunted. I'm not saying it's not. I just don't believe what the Lutz family had said. Maybe they heard a little something here and there and they thought, oh, we can do this or do that. Or maybe they had it planned out all along, you know what I mean, to to move into a house where there was, you know, just one year earlier, there were six gruesome murders in. And then they could make up some fabricated story, make a book, make a lot of money, which ultimately they did. Now, George and Kathleen, Kathleen Lutz are both gone right now. They are dead. And the only one alive in this whole picture right now is... Um, one, the, the, um, I'm trying to think here. Ronnie DeFeo, as of right now in 2020, is still alive in prison. He was sentenced to prison for life. He's still alive. Obviously, all the DeFeos are dead but him, so he's the only living one. And the Lutzes died. Um, now they did have children that are still alive to this day. And they've interviewed one of them and they, they do talk about weird, scary things that took place in that house. So there could be some truth to it. I don't know. But I believe that whatever it was, if anything, that happened in that house, that the Lutz family um, definitely embellished it, um, really made it very much larger than what it was. And there's probably way more um, fiction involved with their story than there is um, nonfiction. I truly believe that, guys. I believe what happened was Dawn and his, um, her brother, Ronnie DeFeo Jr., killed their family. At least Ronnie killed the dad and the sister killed the rest of them. That's what I truly believe. I truly believe that. And then, of course, Ronnie killed Dawn, which was 18 at the time. So, for that house to be haunted, though, um, well, I should say this. Everybody that moves into that house moves right out um they never they're never there longer than really a year and a lot of people say oh it's because it's haunted it's haunted well if you look on youtube guys there's a lot of videos out there of gawkers that go to the house take photos of the house want their picture taken in front of the house trying to look through the house windows going on the property and trespassing you name it they do it um it it, it would be very hard living there it really would guys it really would so a lot of people also say, well, it's, you know, the Amityville, it's all fake. No, it's not, guys. Murder did happen there, but what could be fake is the paranormal stuff. We don't know about that. But the murders are 100% legit. 100% it happened at 112 Ocean Avenue. They even renamed the address to 108 Ocean Avenue to deter people from going there and looking for the house. But, you know, that didn't work. Everybody found it. They know where it's at. Pretty interesting story. This is one story that I've been interested in for pretty much my entire life after I found out that Amityville was actually nonfiction. It was actually real. Um, that's what I believe, guys. I believe Dawn helped out in the murders. She actually committed most of them. Her brother helped out. The Lutz family moved in and fabricated a story and made money. And everybody's moving out of the house because of gawkers. Not ghosts, but being pestered. So if you're watching this video, guys, leave them in peace. Seriously, there's nothing going on in Amityville. There's really nothing going on in Amityville. Um, the Lutz family made a lot of money off that. Basically, blood money because they're making money off people's deaths. So just leave the families be that move into that house. It's a beautiful house. 
and we wouldn't want to see it torn down because of gawkers and or people breaking in and getting hurt or something like that. So uh, that's it for now, guys and girls. I hope you enjoyed the video. Coming up next is just a crime scene photo of Allison. Um, you don't have to watch that if you don't want to. Um, there's actually going to be one when she's... Uh, actually, I'm going to show some of them where they're in their beds dead, and then I'll show one autopsy photo. And I will also post, at the very end, the funeral. So you'll get to see the funeral of the DeFeos. This is the actual funeral. And I'm going to post, um, actually right after this, this segment right here, I'm going to post the video that I have of inside the house. I got a couple clippings that will show you inside the Amityville house, and it'll show you inside the infamous red room in the Amityville house. All right? All right, guys. I hope you enjoy it. Um, if you do like this content, please subscribe and like this video. Once I get to a thousand subscribers, I'm going to start going live doing things. So I got a ways to go right now, guys. But um, thank you so much for watching. I hope you subscribe. And thank you for liking ahead of time. All right, guys. Take care. This is the window. Oh, you can see that it's exactly the same as it has been for the last 51 years. The house was built in 1928. There's all the old paint, the old putty. Nothing's been disturbed. Perfectly innocent windows. This is the original banister in the book. Uh, it was supposed to have been torn out of its hinges and completely demolished or something. Uh, as you can see, it is the original banister. It's been here, like everything else, 50 years, and it's still in perfect condition. This is the door of our home. In the book, it became a 250-pound door, which was completely blown out of its frame and off its hinges. As you can see, it's the original door, solid as a rock, immovable, and quite innocent. My name is Patty Camarado. I was friends with Allison Maceo, the girl who was murdered with the rest of her family here in 1974. This, I'm gonna show you, is a mysterious red room that's so noted for in the book. This door, which they say was never here, was here, is here, always will be here, I suppose. This is the red room. Nothing more than a storage area where Allison and her brothers and I used to keep toys. Just red, you know? There's never any feeling of spirit, presence, or ghosts or any sort of thing like that. It's just a play area. I used to keep toys. Nothing more than that. question about this crime which still hasn't been answered the question of motive it's reported that ronald defeo jr stood to gain about two hundred thousand dollars in life insurance from the death of his family police say they're not ruling that out as a possibility no doubt it's one of the questions that could be considered by the grand jury this week in amityville long island Bill Barnard, aqua survey was Barnard. contracted by documentary filmmaker ryan katzenbach who had been researching the infamous murders Police at the time recovered one weapon, a 35 caliber Marlin 336 hunting rifle. Based on his research,
Katzenbach suspected a second weapon. A snub-nosed 38 was also in the killer's possession the night of the murders. He called in Aqua Survey to perform an electromagnetic or EM survey of a section of canal near the scene of the murders where he believed the second weapon may have been discarded. Towing a military-grade EM array behind one of their vessels, Aqua Survey located 317 metallic objects in the area of interest. The location of all objects were charted within inches of accuracy using survey-grade DGPS. From the 317 metallic targets found on site, the ASI team narrowed the possibilities down to a handful of targets to be investigated. An ASI survey vessel placed the recovery team over each target location. An EM probe was then hand-pushed into the sediment to further pinpoint each object. Divers used the probe to guide them through up to four feet of soft mud to reach each target. All right, he's bringing it up. He's bringing it up. Upon diving on the third target, a volunteer diver from the Long Island Divers Association soon surfaced. He held in his hand the remains of the trigger receiver section of a top brake revolver, seemingly of 38 caliber. The gun was promptly bagged and tagged by the Suffolk County Police, who supervised the recovery. In murder cases, sometimes finding the murder weapon is just as important as getting a confession. Propel your team past the well-known limitations of side-scan sonar and magnetometer equipment by giving your dive team cutting-edge support with e The Cromedies, who bought the house, have packed up and left, driven away by an onslaught of tourists and pranksters who still continue to come and gawk, not fooled by the now-changed address out in front. Now, why did you come by tonight to look at this house? To see what that book was all about and everything about the house, the way it looked, and all the things that people say about it. Oh, we just wanted to see what it was like. I guess we just specifically came from Chicago to see it. But do you believe all the stories? Yeah, I do. They're kind of creepy. They gave me the creeps that... Why do you believe it when the present owners say there's no truth to it at all? They've been living here for almost two years. Oh, I didn't know they had present owners. I thought it was deserted. A man who said he was a friend of the Cromedies also came by, but insisted he not be photographed. You say a friend of yours lives here and you've been in the house. Is there any truth to all these stories that it's haunted and there are weird smells and slime and all those other things? Nothing at all. Uh, it's all a bunch of lies. Well, how do you feel about all these tourists coming by and the movie opening and all of this? What, what do you think of that? Well, I live right down the road and it's a pain in the neck because you can't even get down the block. But when we started rolling the cameras, I had no idea just how much of a pain in the neck it was for the man now temporarily living in the house. As Frank Birch and another man came to the porch, I walked up the driveway to talk to him. He refused and demanded I leave. I thought I did so fairly quickly, but apparently not quickly enough. Within minutes, a police car arrived, then another. Birch came out and told the police he was pressing charges, my crime trespassing. I begged for mercy. None was forthcoming. I was shown into a police car and driven to the Amityville police station. Inside, officers pulled out eight separate forms to be signed. I sat by nervously while my camera crew waited outside. Mercifully, I was finally able to convince Mr. Burtz that I had not intended to cause any problems and had not in fact been aware I was trespassing. He signed forms rescinding his charges. I signed forms releasing him from charges of false arrest. We shook hands, and after more than an hour in captivity, I was finally free.
uncles and aunts of mine who have played in this house as children, uh, played in this house myself as a child. And there's no doubt about the tragedy that took place. To be very honest, the reason we bought the house at the time was it was a, it was a, it was a good buy. And because we loved the house. It was, it is a beautiful house. And uh, we really felt that once we moved in, we changed the number, uh, we repainted it, and we made it a beautiful part of the community again. And we really thought everything would just go away. We, we never dreamt what would take place here. The fame of the Amityville house brought the gawkers, the tourists, and the traffic jammers. It was such an, a pleasant scene inside here. And outside, it was so insane. It was right after the book had come out. People all fighting to have their picture taken in front of the house. And here we were trying to have a lovely, quiet Sunday afternoon together. And, and, and this insanity was out there. When they came, they, they literally on Christmas Eve attacked the house and uh, three cars. One car drove all over the front lawn. Another one watched for the police and the other group, all, all men, about 20 to 25, I guess. They, the other groups just stood out on the front porch and urinated all over it on Christmas Eve. Very simple thing to write to the National Weather Bureau down in Washington and, and ask for the weather on the dates when that coincide with the book. And they will see for themselves that none of the weather coincides. Not one day, not one snowflake, not one raindrop. As far as the priest goes, he testified in federal court in Brooklyn in October, I think it was, right. that um, he had only come to this house once to bless it. As far as the rest of the book goes, none of it was true. He did not uh, have any of the afflictions on his hands and the the sores and the stench and uh, anything that was mentioned either in the book or in the movie. None of that was true. And this is um, under oath in federal court. We just hope that sooner or later we're going to knock a complete hole in this uh, charade that's been created and hope that we can just get back to living a normal life again. Not have to worry about when we come home at night that there are 30 people in the yard that maybe we'll have to call the police again to give them a break to give the name 13 minutes up right now back in november 1975 six people uh, were killed in a an awful uh, mass murder god knows it. it's got to be awful in a small town on long island the town is called amityville the murders took place in this house one year later, George and Kathleen Lutz bought the house and they moved into it with their three children. After living there for 28 days, they were convinced the house was possessed by some kind of, uh, of evil force and they left their belongings and they fled and they were really terrified. The events that supposedly took place there during those 28 days have been, uh, have been put down in a best-selling book. It's called The Amityville Horror and there is now a movie out or about to come out of the book. George and Kathleen Lutz are with us this morning to talk about what happened during those 28 days in Amityville. And James Brolin, super young man, actor. Thank you. Yes, much pleasure. Good to see you again, Jim. Thank he you. plays George Lutz in the movie, and Jim is with us this morning, and it's great seeing you again. Great and seeing you again. Lutz's, good morning to you both. Good morning. All right, first of all, the book and the movie depict all these kind of weird, strange things that happened in the house during those 28 days when you were there. What kind of things, George, happened physically? What were some of the things that happened that scared you? Well, at first... Just moving into the house was fine. It's a lovely house, yeah. and we enjoyed moving in. Uh, within a week, Kathy's hand had been touched by something that we discussed and couldn't explain. It was just something unseen. Within I mean, this is in the daylight, or was it? Yes, it's it was during the day. Right. Okay. We also had uh, hordes of flies that would appear within two rooms, and no matter how many times we would kill them, they would reappear. All right, now flies can be a real problem in this part of the country in the summer, sure. in any house, you know. But if you have two or three or four within one room, that could be commonplace. But when you're winter. talking over a hundred... Right. Well, this was the winter. Mm -hmm. Yes. And you're talking about how many? Over a hundred flies over 100 at flies. one time. And then you'd go around and kill them. They'd be lying on the floor. You'd come back an hour later and they would be there more of them. 
Okay. There was something about green slime. What was that on the wall in the movie? This green slime comes out of the walls, right? right. George, did that happen? As the movie did it, not exactly. No. Yeah. It was more of uh, a gelatin kind of substance that we thought the children had somehow mixed something up and, and spilled it around the house. The next yeah. time it happened, the kids were at school, and there was just no way to explain how it got there. Did you all call, a, you know, a contractor or a carpenter or anybody to come and look and, it, and try to... We had sure. several repairmen sure. come in. Uh, telephone repairmen came three times because each time we would try and communicate with the priests, we would run into faulty connections. Uh, we had extreme fluctuations in the heat between 40 and 50 degree fluctuations. Three times the serviceman came in. One time he was there, he heard the furnace functioning, and yet there was no heat within the house. The temperature was at 40, and yet the thermostat read 80. Okay, now, but you had somebody inspect the entire heating system. Goodness knows those of us who live in the North know what can happen with heating systems in a house, especially old houses. George, something about, there was also something about black in the toilets, the water black and making the the ceramic, the bowls or whatever the black. The china itself, it wasn't in the water. The china itself turned black. And at yeah. first it was one bathroom and then another and then another. So that by the time the investigators got there, a number of them were still black. You know, it was still that way. There was never any reasonable explanation. Did you have a plumber come in? I mean, when you first spotted no, it. No, have... it wasn't a problem with the water. The it's... water was clean. Did a pl it was normal. But did you invite any contractor or somebody like that just to come say hey what's wrong with the toilets no because you didn't yeah one of the things we found was the keyholes would eat ooze a black substance which was of the same nature and appearance as that which was on the porcelain in the toilets and when the investigative team came on march 6 1976 mm -hmm. the substance was still on the keyholes and they were able to obtain samples of it because it was never in a moist right. condition, uh, condition. Right. and they wouldn't do physical damage to the door in other words carve out a piece of wood without our consent had either of you had any experience before with the occult no. or the supernatural ever before we didn't believe in it were you afraid for your children why didn't you leave earlier than the 28 days if you were terrified well it was our house First of all, we, yeah. got, we had never intended to give it up. Even after we moved out, we intended to find out what was wrong and, and move back in there. Mm -hmm. um, that's why the investigation was held, and, and people from different psychic research groups that at least we could check their credentials were called in and asked to, to come in. We've been asked many times why we stayed so long. It's very hard to, remember exact the exact emotions or the yeah. the moment why you would make a decision and why not but you finally did make well, it well by the time we left we had lost a considerable amount of weight kathy was passing out quite regularly i had lost over 26 pounds and we were just reacting from one happening to another we weren't really so you were generally we weren't up thinking and... yes yeah. as as we normally would jim you played George in the movie, mm -hmm. and you did research this and worked on it and so forth. You smiled. Do you believe them? Do I? Yeah. yeah. When I'm sitting here with them, yes, I do. I, and I've watched George, and I've watched, uh, you know, you've been an actor, David, and you kind of know how to watch for telltale signs when you're doing research and watching to people, and we also, uh, well, you get an insight. And I, I, uh, I can't say that looking over the story i uh, i believe the book as it's presented totally mm -hmm. but uh, sitting with his people it's uh, mm -hmm. it's hard to deny a lot of the facts to were you George gave up a lot of money yeah were you more frightened than i playing? think that he would make on the book yeah uh, you know what i mean yeah. Yeah. Thanks why, why would you keep up working on this if it was terrifying and not a not a pleasant experience why do you why don't you just leave it behind you and forget it and move on to other things? Things of this nature happen quite frequently. And when they happen to, to you? families, no, not to oh, us. Yeah. Mm. This was something we learned from the investigators and the psychics that came in. And when it happens to a family, usually they close the door and they don't talk about it. Yeah. And unless 
these things are talked about, they'll never be understood. We went out when the movie was being filmed, Jim. We went out uh, to the house and talked to the couple who live in the house, or did a year ago. And they said they'd had no problems whatsoever. Everything was just fine. They implied that, that this is all a big hoax. Well, one of the things we're very happy with is four weeks ago, both of us were subjects of a polygraph test. Right. It was given by Chris Gugas and uh, Michael Rice. And we both passed with flying colors. Sure. We were tested separately on it. Is the movie fun? Well, the movie's very effective. I th And I'll tell you, when I was sent this script, and, you know, we're all at the mercy of scripts in this business, um, I read it. Uh, I was working on another picture, and I didn't have much time, and I read it quickly, and they wanted an answer. And I just thought, this is going to make a terrific movie. And when I called, I said, let's get involved. And uh, the agency said, why don't you pick up the book tomorrow? And I said, oh, yeah, there's a book. And then the next day, I found out it was a true story. I wasn't aware of it. And so my involvement from the beginning was really sort of naive. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just took it as something that was going to be a wonderful movie, and it is. Um, I didn't realize what I was getting into. <laughs> ah. uh, George and Kathy Lutz, thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much. Good luck. Living in Southern California. Yeah. Weather's better out there. Isn't it? Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Jim, good seeing you again. Good seeing you, David. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. This is what I consider the most terrifying picture of a spirit or demon the Amityville Ghost Boy. This clip explains how it was captured. Weeks after the family left, a legion of Ghostbusters came here to investigate the family's claims of a frightening and demonic possession. It was like a psychic slumber party. The idea was we were going to spend the entire night in the house. Reporter Laura DiDio was there. Pictures that March night in 1976 show the crowd moving from room to room, trying to pick up ghostly vibrations. Marvin is from this, you know, the same school of reporting that we all came from, which is, show us, let's get this on tape. And I remember Marvin turning to me and said, I don't think we have, we've really got it. It meaning a really good story, that sort of smoking gun that you always want to see on camera. There was nothing out of the ordinary that you actually saw other than the impressions you heard from a psychic. Just because you give a ghost party doesn't mean the ghost and the demons and the goblins or whatever is there are going to show up and perform for you. According to the Warrens, photographs taken during their investigation offer compelling evidence that supernatural forces were at work at 112 Ocean Avenue. The camera was set up in a tripod and it just automatically shot off a flash photograph every few moments. And there were rolls and rolls of film of this particular doorway. It was into our daughter Tennessee's room. The photographs were being cataloged by a secretary I had years later in California. And she was pregnant. And every time she picked up this one particular picture, the baby inside her jumped. And lo and behold, on the second floor in the doorway of one room, there is the distinct figure of a little boy peering out from the doorway. There were no children in the house that night. So it's like, okay, where did this come from? And we called Missy and asked her, who was this? And she said, oh, that's the boy I used to play with there first we had heard of that. Remember that Gene Campbell, the man who took these pictures, is an expert. Well, you're looking at a face of what looks like a child. If you look at it, it looks like luminescent eyes, but it could be eyeglasses, it could be anything. A demonic spirit. It can appear as anything it wants to appear as. Although they insist that no children were present in the house when this photograph was taken, the Warrens admit that it has never been scientifically authenticated. Some people believe this is not a picture of a little boy, but rather Paul Barks, the photographer that was brought in by the Warrens. The problem I have with that is that they're comparing it to a handful of pictures. 
But when you look at who was in that house, the house was filled with people, people who spent hours with Paul Bartz, people who could have easily recognized him in the photo. That house was full of people. You had Gene Campbell, the expert photographer who set up this flash photography to begin with. Then there was Paul Bartz, of course, and Lorraine and Ed Warren. And then you had Marvin Scott from the Channel 5 News team with his camera crew of several people and his reporter, Laura DiDio. You had Duke University professors, Dr. Alex Tanis, Dr. Brian Riley. You had Dr. Carl Osis from the American Society of Psychic Research. You had Mary Pasquarella from the Psychic Research Institute in Hamden, Connecticut. I mean, it was like Laura DiDio said, it was a slumber party full of people who spent hours in that house. And nobody recognized that photo of the boy to be Paul Bartz. No, that's not a picture of Paul Bartz. His plaid shirt doesn't even line up correctly with the little boy. But there is a photo of the young DeFeo boy in a plaid shirt that more closely resembles this picture. I don't think it's a picture of the little boy. I think it's a demonic spirit peeking out, pretending to be that little boy. All right, guys, so there you have it. There are many more videos on YouTube of people filming this house. Um, just, just YouTube it. Go to YouTube and type in filming the real Amityville house, and you'll get a lot of results. Um, I remember one where a guy was standing there filming, and somebody beeped the horn at him when they were driving by, and he flipped them off. It, it's really extreme with people visiting that house. As you can see, people as far away as Chicago drove all the way down there just to get a glimpse of a house that they'll never actually step foot in. I can't lie though, guys. Um, if I were allowed to investigate any house, it would be the Amityville house. I don't do um, paranormal research, or I do paranormal research, but I don't actually do investigations. Like I don't, I don't go out taking photos purposely to capture, you know, orbs or, or ghostly images. I don't do EVP anymore, but I would swallow my pride, so to speak. And I would do that if allowed in that house, but I do have my reasons and maybe in a future video, I'll explain why I don't ghost hunt anymore. I only research the paranormal and talk about different occurrences that are related to the paranormal. I'll explain in a later video all about that and why I don't do it. But this one's about Amityville, guys. Please, in the comments below, can you tell me your scenario? What, what do you think happened in Amityville on, on November 13th, 1974? And why do you think all these families continue to move out? And what about the Lutz family? Do you find any truth to their story? Or do you think it's all fiction and made up and they just wanted to get rich? Which... They pretty much did. I've gave you mine, guys. To sum it all up, I believe Don DeFeo killed Louise DeFeo, Allison DeFeo, Mark DeFeo, and John DeFeo. And I believe Ronald DeFeo, or Junior, sorry, I always say, keep calling him Junior, or I keep calling Junior Senior. I believe that he actually killed the dad, which that was the ultimate plan. And... Ultimately, I believe he killed his sister Dawn because she had taken the lives of his little brothers and sisters. That's what I believe happened with the murder scenario, okay? With the paranormal scenario, I don't believe the lots of stories at all. I believe it was all made up to make money, and I believe that the people in that house in Amityville, New York, are all moving out because of gawkers and are sick of being pestered and bugged. That's what I truly believe. Now, is that house actually haunted? As I said earlier in this video, absolutely it could be. Six people died in there. So that's pretty much my summary, guys. Dawn helped out um, in the killings, and the paranormal aspect is a hoax. That's it. I hope you enjoyed the video, guys. Take care.